Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Jordanian demonstrators demand the resignation of the government. Algerian elections maintain the status quo as the Green Alliance claims widespread fraud. And Egypt holds its first ever televised presidential debate. Mosaic. World news from the Middle East begins now. A demonstration was held in Jordan to demand comprehensive reforms and the formation of a national salvation government to implement constitutional and legal amendments that will lead to an elected government. Mayan Abu Dalu reports from Jordan. Despite the peaceful nature of the Jordanian mobilization for reform, the Muslim Brotherhood announced today that such a mobilization might take the opposite form. More than 3,000 demonstrators from the Islamist movement, along with others from various reform, youth and popular blocs, took to the streets to condemn the policies of the Dr. Faiz Tarawne-led government. If prices increase, we will hold the regime and the king personally responsible. They are responsible for toying with the people's way of life. We reject the formation of governments and the submission of this law to the Council of Ministers before the elections. We are calling for fundamental and comprehensive reforms. The participants slammed the Tarawne government as a ceremonial entity run by the intelligence agency. They called for the release of Jordanian prisoners held in the Zionist occupation's jails. They also chanted slogans praising the revolution in Syria. The theme? You don't understand. The proof? The reforms have not been achieved and the voice of the people is still echoing loud, demanding tangible reforms, including constitutional and judicial, as well as in the area of public policies. The participants also called for the release of prisoners of opinion, most notably journalist Jamal al Mutasib, who was detained after publishing an article alleging misconduct by the royal palace. They also criticized the government over its dismissal of corruption cases and for exonerating corrupt officials without even one dinar being reimbursed by the state treasury. Yesterday, the Tarawne-led government announced its intention to stop subsidizing food products and raise electricity prices. Today, popular and Islamist mobilizations rejected such decisions and demanded an elected government that is capable of resolving the citizens' problems as well as empower the national economy. Ma'in Abu Dalu, New TV, Amman. Algeria's interior minister, the Hawel Kabliya, announced the results of the parliamentary elections, saying the ruling National Liberation Front won 220 of the 462 seats. The National Democratic Rally received 68 seats, and the Islamists received almost 60 seats, including 48 for the Green Algeria Alliance, which came in third place. <laughs> The National Liberation Front obtained 220 seats, of which 68 were won by women. The National Democratic Rally received 68 seats, 23 were won by women. The Green Algeria Alliance obtained 48 seats, including 15 won by women. The Front of Socialist Forces received 21 seats, of which seven were won by women. The Workers' Party received 20 seats, of which 10 were won by women. Joining us from Algeria is Dr. Fatah Rabhiya, the Secretary General of the Nahda Movement and a leader with the Green Algeria Alliance. What is your reaction to these results, Dr. Fatah? In the name of God, the most gracious and the most merciful. I think the results announced by the Interior Minister will be challenged politically and also by the Algerian people. 
since the Algerians were expecting changes and an Arab Spring through the ballot boxes. But the results were disappointing. Algeria returned to the one-party rule era. And particularly disappointing for you, since your coalition was expecting to win the first place. Yes, but it wasn't merely expectations. Until last night, the results were favorable to the Green Algeria Alliance. Even the official results that were announced indicated we were leading, and we were in the first place in 17 districts. But then we found ourselves missing from 31 provinces or districts. This led us to confirm that breaches and violations that were limited to certain areas had spread. So this is why we're questioning the results. So you consider the performance of your alliance to be much worse than anticipated because of breaches and violations. Why haven't we heard any complaints from your side during the voting or even before the elections? Before the voting started and before we engaged in the electoral process, we warned of this issue. And we also did during the elections, and we held press conferences to speak out about the issue during the voting. So today we hold the administration that oversaw the elections fully responsible. A U.S. soldier has been killed in Afghanistan after a man in Afghan army uniform opened fire on U.S.-led foreign forces in the eastern Kunar province. Two other U.S. soldiers have been injured in the incident. The attacker reportedly managed to get away from the scene. U.S.-led forces have also confirmed the death of another trooper in southern Afghanistan. That attack is blamed on Taliban militants. Separately, a bomb went off at Jalalabad airport in the east. The airport is mainly used by American forces. There is no report of any casualties as of yet. Earlier, our correspondent Faiz Khorshid in the Afghan capital, Kabul, gave us more details about the latest attack on U.S. soldiers and the security circumstances in the country. We're all inside a military base in Kunar province, in Ghaziabad district of Kunar province, when the Afghan soldier opened a fire on American forces. Why? Because of a verbal clash. We have been told this by Afghan officials from the same region. One American soldier has been killed and two others have been badly wounded. The, the, it has been also confirmed by NATO headquarters here in Kabul. The attacker has been identified as Mahmoud, the, uh, a resident of Marja in southern Helmand province. This man was transferred to, uh, to Kunar province 20 days back to fight jointly with the American forces against the Taliban militants. With the latest fatality, the number of uh, foreign soldiers killed by their Afghan colleagues has reached to 20. Now, the U.S. headquarters, their military men are deeply worried about this trend, and they have termed this as green on blue attacks, and they have called on the Afghan government to to adopt more strict measures when they recruit people as police officers and soldiers in their military institutions. Egyptian expats in several countries, including Lebanon and Jordan, have started voting in Egypt's first post-revolution presidential elections. Expats have until May the 17th to cast their ballots in Egyptian embassies and consulates. Egyptians themselves will go to the polls on the 23rd and 24th of May to elect a new president since the fall of the Mubarak regime last February. Meanwhile, two of the election frontrunners have taken part in the country's first presidential race in form of a live debate. Former member of the Muslim Brotherhood, Abdul Munim Abu Futu, faced ex-Arab League chief Amr Musa. The two singled out Israel as an enemy of Egypt. They also agreed that the principles of Sharia law should be the main source of legislation. Egypt's first ever televised presidential debate was held Thursday night in Cairo between the two front runners. The two front runners are former Foreign Minister Omar Musa and Amman Abu Futuh, who represents the moderate Islamic bloc and former leading member of the Muslim Brotherhood.
Millions across the country were tuned in to their television sets as the two candidates were asked 24 questions in two separate sections. In the first half, the two candidates answered questions concerning their platforms and policies on health, security, and even how they would handle demonstrations once they reach office and the status of the military after the transition of power. I think that Abu Fatou is better and more importantly, he's a revolutionary symbol and not a remnant of the previous regime. We were glued to the chairs watching this historic debate, and I think that Amr Musa was more talkative and is more politically aware. Sure, people are very excited because it, uh, on this it depends their uh, future, the future, and the future of liberty, freedom, and uh, democracy. So they are very attentive, attentive. Each candidate received two minutes to answer questions, as well as several chances to address the other candidate, during which Musa pressed on Abu Fatuh's affiliations with the Muslim Brotherhood and other more radical Islamic groups, while Abu Fatuh stressed during his questions to affirm Musa's affiliation to the former regime, under which he served as foreign affairs minister for 10 years. The debate, which lasted for more than three hours, might heavily factor in swaying the 50 percent undecided voters in the directions of either candidate. The Egyptian elections are slated to start on May 23rd and 24th. This unprecedented debate is only the first of many to come in the next few days before the planned presidential elections and they are likely to sway the big bulk of yet undecided voters in Egypt. Hamas prime, Hamas's prime minister says Iran needs no help from its government to confront Israel. Ismail Haniya says Iran is strong enough to deal with Tel Aviv in case of an Israeli attack. And he also said that Iran has never asked for anything from, him, from Hamas. He, however, warned that Israeli threats of an attack on Iran would have grave consequences for the entire region. The Hamas' leader's comments come at the backdrop of allegations by Israel and its allies who label the resistance movement a potential Iranian proxy. Elsewhere, the Hamas premier said the so-called Grand Coalition, established by the Israeli regime this week, could have external motives. Israel, which possesses the region's only atomic arsenal, has repeatedly threatened Iran with military strikes over its nuclear energy program. Iran says this program is peaceful and has promised a massive response to any Israeli aggression. Tens of thousands participated in demonstrations across different parts of Syria on Friday to demand the downfall of President Bashar al-Assad's regime despite the heavy security deployment of regime forces, according to activists in the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. Meanwhile, condemnations and international reactions to Thursday's two explosions in Damascus continue. The blasts killed over 55 people and injured dozens. The smoke of Thursday's explosions in Damascus dissipated to make the destruction visible. However, the truth behind the incident has still not been revealed. International criticism of the explosions continues to be generated from all parties, but neither side is being blamed nor exonerated. As for responsibility for the blasts, the counter accusations continue between the Syrian regime and its opposition, but neither side of the conflict has compelling evidence, only suspicions and analysis. The reason why we believe it's the regime who is behind it. Is the reason why we believe it's the regime who is behind it is because no one else has anything to benefit from it. Not the opposition, nor Al-Qaeda, which will lose many of its supporters, if it has any. The regime benefits from portraying the peaceful protesters as armed combatants. <laughs> The Syrian scene was unchanged this Friday, the day on which regime opponents are accustomed to escalating their protests. Demonstrations and protests were held here and there under the banner, Victory from God and Relief Soon. The current security deployment did not prevent additional demonstrations from being held in many parts of Damascus and its surroundings and other cities and towns. Opposition sources reported gunfire, including one witnessed at Al Malah Mosque in Hama and in Adwan, Sayr, Al Mahatta in Dara, and Al Kusur and Al Rastan in Homs, and Kafar Nebel in Idlib and Hama. 
عدد من القتلى والجرحى A number of people were killed and injured in Homs when a bus was fired at by what regime sources described as armed groups. تزايد عدد المراقبين الدوليين في The growing number of international observers in Syria has seemingly not put an end to the escalating violence in the country, but the team's mission continues. مستمرة أهم ما نريد التأكد منه Our most essential task is ensuring that violence in all forms stops. The most painful sight is all this loss of life. We express our condolences and sympathy with the families of the victims. This is why we're focusing on putting an end to this. Amid the escalating violence in Syria, diplomatic sources say the European Union will impose new sanctions on Syria next week that will include freezing the assets of two institutions and three individuals. Most are believed to be funding sources for President Bashar al-Assad's regime. This will be the fifth round of sanctions on the Syrian regime since the crackdown on protests began over a year ago. Anwar Alansi, BBC. Sudanese President Omar Hassan al-Bashir's tone escalated while announcing his country's rejection of the UN and African demand to stop the battles with South Sudan under the penalty of imposing sanctions. And in an even sharper message to Juba, al-Bashir assured that there will be no talks with the South regarding oil before resolving security issues, vowing to topple its government as border battles are still continuing. Our correspondent Sami al-Shanawi reports from al-Khartoum. We have to do what we have to do. No security council, no peace council, not even the entire world can make us act differently. Al-Bashir Al -Bashir pledged his acceptance of good neighborly relations with Juba's government, but with a list of rigid conditions. This other side of the escalation between Juba and Al-Khartoum might last as long as there is an opposition in both countries. If we do not solve our security problems, and if we are not assured that we are 100 percent safe and that we will not be harmed at all by the South, there will be no talks over any issue, not oil, nor trade, nor citizenship rights, and not even ABA or anything else. <laughs> And in the light of the accusations exchanged between the two sides, Al Khartoum denied it attacked Juba, causing an embarrassment for the South at the UN Security Council. Yes, Juba is doing that as a justification for violating the terms of the Security Council's resolution. It always says that we shelled it. It wants to criminalize us in front of the international community, but the South is missing the evidence and the witnesses. But the Sudanese army does not deny its movements on the border and continues to clear the border area areas of the northern sector's People's Liberation Movement, which is supported by Juba, according to Khartoum. There seems to be more tension between Juba and al-Khartoum, especially after al-Bashir's escalating tone and his challenge to the international community and the African Union as well. Sami al-Shanawi, Dubai TV, al-Khartoum. The case of Palestinian prisoners on hunger strike is gaining momentum inside and outside the walls of prison. In a new development, three prisoners on a hunger strike for 50 days rejected an Israeli offer to deport them to a European country for three months under the pretext of seeking medical treatment in exchange for ending their strike. Palestinian sources said the Israeli prison service has taken measures to ease restrictions imposed on Palestinian prisoners in an attempt to end the mass hunger strike carried out by nearly 4,700 detainees so far. from the new unity government continues as the details slowly emerge about the contents of the deal Knesset members across the political spectrum are demanding more transparency IBA's Ariel Russia brings us the latest the new unity government has claimed its first political casualty Kadima co-founder Chaim Ramon has resigned from the party in protest of the new alliance he blasted Kadima chairman Shaul Mufaz for turning the centrist faction into a branch of Likud. Mufaz loyalists were quick to hit back, pointing to Ramon's checkered past. One MK remarked that it is unfathomable that a convicted sex offender and the father of political maneuvering in Israel would talk about betrayal. 
A fiery debate in the Knesset plenum yesterday highlighted growing frustration among MKs across the political spectrum at the lack of transparency regarding the agreement signed by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and newly minted Vice Premier Shaul Mufaz. Opposition parties continued to slam the deal as underhanded and pledged to provide a formidable alternative to the coalition. I think it's very clear. Mufaz is irrelevant. Israel, he become part of the Likud. Right now, we have the real contest in Israel. The Labour Party vis-a-vis -vis Likud. Remaining members of the Prime Minister's previous government vowed to stay in the coalition, even with the addition of Kadima. I've always been in favor of a wide coalition, and as such, I can only congratulate uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu uh, for including our coalition, uh, Kadima in our coalition. We should lead the coalition, but I will make sure that the Prime Minister and the other ministers of the Likud are committed to the Likud platform and not to the Labour platform or to the Kadima platform. It will be very interesting in the next few months here in the Knesset and within the government. We supported this from the beginning. Uh, this was uh, put together by a select few, but certainly my party uh, was all in favor. But Amid the political that, uh, tumult, Deputy Prime Minister Dan Meridor of Likud is now saying that he is in favor of a limited settlement freeze in the West Bank. The timing of Meridor's comments could be an indication of a policy shift now that Kadima is part of the government. Other Likud ministers insist that that's simply not the case. Prime Minister Netanyahu realizes that concessions are not exactly the goal of the negotiations. Uh, it's very easy to give concessions, as we've seen in the past, and to, to get anything in return. The political earthquake continues to rattle the Knesset, and its aftershocks are sure to be felt for some time to come. In Jerusalem, Ariel Reshev, IBA News. The U.S. House of Representatives has overwhelmingly passed bipartisan legislation that affirms America's commitment to Israel's security. The vote was 411 in favor, only two opposed. The Enhanced Security Cooperation Act of 2012 was introduced by Republican Congressman Eric Cantor of Virginia and Democratic Whip Steny Hoyer of Maryland. Cantor said the bill recognizes Israel's right to defend itself against threats. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee welcomed the legislation, which will explore ways to enhance Israel's qualitative military edge and stresses the need for strategic cooperation between Washington and Jerusalem in the areas of missile defense, intelligence, energy, and homeland and cybersecurity. The measure will also work toward helping Israel receive an expanded role in NATO. Dozens of Bahraini demonstrators were injured by pellet bullets and poisonous gas fired by regime forces, attempting to disperse protest rallies calling for the release of rights activist Nabil Rajab. Meanwhile, angry protests broke out across various Bahraini regions in solidarity with religious scholar Sheikh Isa Qasim, who received threats from the regime. The popular revolutionary mobilization in Bahrain is continuing despite the terror and detention campaign it faces. The Bahraini people took to the streets in solidarity with detained revolutionary youth, activists and leaders, most prominently Nabil Rajab. Different regions in Bahrain witnessed angry demonstrations and rallies demanding the release of Rajab and detained opposition leaders. The village of Bani Jamra witnessed a popular rally near the home of detained activist Rajab. The participants affirmed their demand for freedom and dignity, confirming that the illegitimate Bahraini regime is being thrown off balance by the popular mobilization witnessed in the country. The regime wanted to silence this dignified teacher, Nabil Rajab. As we rally here in front of his home, Rajab affirmed that he will not retreat from his rightful position. Bani Jamra, Wasitra Maza, Al Musalla, Wajad Hafs, 
Bani Jamra, Sitra, Al Musalla, Jad Hafs, Al Manama, and Kharza Khan are witnessing angry popular mobilizations demanding the regime to release activist Rajab. The demonstrators believe that Rajab is paying the price of freedom, equality, and human rights. The targeting of religious scholar Sheikh Isa Qasim by the regime has triggered mass rallies. The demonstrators accused the authorities of seeking to fuel sectarian strife in the country. Meanwhile, the crackdown continues against civilians who are facing a campaign of terror and detention and have become daily targets of the regime's gunfire. However, with each passing day, they affirm they will not be terrorized by the regime's pellet bullets and poisonous gas. The authorities' violence reached an alarming level, especially since more homes are being directly targeted by the security forces that continue to use poisonous gas canisters against civilians without any restrictions. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.